Welcome to yet another episode of The Conversation. My name is Anotida Chikumbu and I'm your host. And today I'm excited to have Professor Jeffrey Alman. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Alman is an Associate Professor of History and is also the Director of the African Studies Program at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, Professor Jeffrey Alman, welcome to The Conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. I'm very much uh, happy to have you and you are very much welcome to the show. Uh, today, uh, we would like to discuss uh, your book, Living with Nkrumahism, uh, Nation State and Pan-Africanism in Ghana. Uh, but uh, first of all, before we get into, into the discussion of your book, uh, can you just uh, briefly describe uh, or take us through your academic journey that then gets us to this publication? Um, how and when did you develop interest in studying African history? Yes. Yeah, well, so um, I'm originally from Nebraska, in the middle of the United States, a small town of 700 or something people. Um, and when, um, after I graduated high school, um, I intended to um, go to college or university in order to study to become um, a high school teacher. Um, and so my first year or so of college was sort of focused on um, just studying how you would become like a social science teacher um, in a high school in the U.S. Um, until I came across, um, it was actually a U.S. history class um, taught by a history professor named Walter Rucker um, at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Um, and Walter, when he was teaching the class, he really... Um, um, so he's a fo his focus is on African American history, um, and he came into the classroom one day and sort of really emphasized that you can't understand American history without understanding African history, uh -huh. um, and that really sort of um, shifted the way that I thought about understanding U.S. history um, from the start. Um, he also really emphasized um, a way of thinking about history that moved away from just sort of names and dates and facts um, and this sort of idea of sort of capital T truths. Um, he actually had this really interesting um, um, first day of class, um, I guess it'd be lesson where he barged into this classroom of 130 something students and wrote like big key truths on the board, big F facts on the board and started crossing them all out. And so it's like, we're, we're gonna talk about sort of history as truth and sort of people's perspectives and this type of thing. Later I learned he stole that from Indiana Jones, um, but it was um, a way that really made me rethink um, how to talk about history. Um, and so combining this with the way that he emphasized sort of history, American history is being connected to Africa. Um, I began to work with him and began to understand um, African, African American history and American history and sort of the African um, continuities within these um, fields. Um, I later combined that with another instructor at the University of Nebraska, um, James Lesur. And um, Jim, when he really focused on history, he's focused on sort of decolonization. And so he introduced me to the idea of decolonization. So combining um, the interactions I had with these two faculty members, I began to think about um, Africa and more broadly sort of um, ways in which um, <clears throat> um, people um, in the world began to imagine their futures and the, the societies that they lived in um, um, in different ways. Um, so my interest in Africa and, and African diaspora really began to expand um, through my interactions with these two faculty members. Um, um, I did a, an undergraduate thesis with them that was sort of a comparative intellectual history of um, W.B. Du Bois' is Pan-Africanism, um, Kwame Nkrumah's um, ideas of Pan-Africanism, and, um, and then Franz Fanon's sort of broader ideas of decolonization. Um, and that sort of laid the foundation um, for the book that came, that came about what would be 13 or 14 years later. Um, so I did this project as an undergraduate um, and um, began to think about like what what comes next, like as all um, mm -hmm. seniors in college do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I began to apply to um, graduate programs um, and I think it would have been 2004, um, which ultimately landed me at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where I had the privilege of working with um, Professor Gene Allman, um, a recent president of the African Studies Association. 
um, um, her focus was on Ghana. So she, um, she obviously sort of read the, um, my application materials, it's also this Ghana, the connection to Nkrumah and Pan-Africanism and um, it made me into the program. But one of the things that she really um, encouraged and challenged me to do when I was an undergrad was to um, think more broadly about what, um, what Pan-Africanism looked like um, within Ghana and sort of really center um, Ghana within sort of the narratives of Pan-Africanism and sort of this Ghanaian sense. Um, um, so the University of Illinois, um, I came up with a potential dissertation project as everyone does. Um, um, this project um, was actually not the project that came about as the book. It was um, this project that eventually I had to abort where I was interested in um, this group of Ghanaians who organized in 1962 go and to to go and fight in the Algerian revolution. And so I was looking at this as sort of a way of actual Pan-African mobilization um, on the ground. Um, it was this group that um, it was sponsored by Nkrumah's government and the CPP, the Commission People's Party. Um, uh -huh. um, and I thought this would be like a really exciting like social history that I could do, right? Uh -huh. uh, Pan-Africanism within Ghana, excuse me. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, so I got on the ground as many graduate students do and um, started going through the archives and like, okay, so they're in the newspapers. Um, I find little hints here and there of, of them, started asking around, found no trace of these people. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then at the same time, a part of this project was going to be going to see if there's anything in Algeria. Um, Algeria is going through quite turbulent time at this um, juncture and it became unsafe to actually go to Algeria um, in um, 2007, 2008, um, or Algiers in particular. Um, so ultimately I was sort of this graduate student on the ground um, with this dissertation project that seemed to just be flailing um, without sort of a, um, it no longer felt feasible. So what I ended up doing is thinking like, Okay, so I see all these interesting like breadcrumbs are being ra uh, laid in the Ghanaian archives and in a variety of Ghanaian archives um, in Accra, um, in Sekundi, um, Kumasi, um, and Sunyani um, about um, Nkrumah's sort of project within Ghana um, and sort of the Pan-African dimensions of that that are actually reaching down into people's lives in really interesting ways through a variety of sort of state-run organizations. Uh -huh. um, the, the Ghana Young Pioneers, um, the Builders Brigade, um, <clears throat> workers, um, uh, the places where people work. Um, so I began to really um, think through like, what does this actually tell us about um, Pan-Africanism and socialism within Ghana and sort of how we could think about the Ghanaian decolonization project um, uh -huh. from, uh, almost from a perspective of a social and cultural history, as opposed to just a political history. Um, that eventually became sort of the foundation of the book um, mm -hmm. and the arguments that I, I was interested in exploring in the book. It became the dissertation. And, um, and then after finishing at Illinois, I began to really um, <clears throat> think through. So I have this sort of outline um, of an argument. Um, where uh, I have sort of all this sort of social history, um, cultural history material about Pan-Africanism in Ghana. And mm -hmm. after that is really a question of um, what, what does this all mean in terms of understanding decolonization, not just within Ghana, but decol the way decolonization worked um, from the ground up um, in Africa more broadly. And so mm -hmm. that's what I spent sort of the the next couple of years really beginning to explore what is what is Nkrumahism um, when we're thinking about it in terms of decolonization more broadly. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the trajectory that led to the book. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for that uh, for that uh, uh, profound background uh, that informs uh, the publication that we have for discussion today. So uh, j just tell me a bit briefly about your experiences in Accra in Ghana. Uh, what was it like? What were, what were the people's perceptions of, of, of Kwame Nkrumah and 
what sort of impression did you get upon visiting Ghana? Yes, yeah, so I, um, the, so I first went to Accra in 2004, 2005, um, it was actually December to January, um, it was part of a, uh, almost, it wasn't really a study abroad experience, but it's like a study abroad experience um, at the University of Illinois. I went back a year later in 2006 in the summer, and really began doing research. Um, and that was sort of, as many are just sort of finding out what you, what, an, what working in an archive is, right? Mm -hmm. Because you, um, you don't necessarily get that experience um, until you actually go and do it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, um, and archives like working, working in archives in the U.S. is very different than working in archives in, um, in many African countries. Um, mm -hmm. And so just sort of, it was filling out what that was like there. Mm -hmm. um, my real sort of, what I consider my real research experience um, was when I arrived for uh, my field work in 2007, which was um, a quite interesting time to be studying in Kruma. It was the 50th anniversary of Ghanaian independence. Um, I arrived um, when did I, a couple months right after um, the 50th anniversary celebra celebrations mm -hmm. um, within, um, within Ghana. So Nkrumah was on everybody's mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it really was like that year was a debate around what was Nkrumah's legacy within Ghana. Um, mm -hmm. It was also within a context where the, um, the MPP um, government, the National Patriotic Party um, government, which has sort of a historical genealogy as connected to the opposition to Nkrumah, was the government in power. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so they were really wrestling with what it meant to um, commemorate Nkrumah um, um, during this time period. Mm -hmm. um, and it led to some really sort of difficult questions for um, within the country about, um, I mean, many of these people who have, who are leaders in the MPP government had family members who are imprisoned by Nkrumah, right? So they weren't particularly interested in, um, in celebrating him as sort of the father of the nation. Um, mm -hmm. So for me as a researcher arriving here, um, the discussions were extreme, like Nkrumah was on everybody's mind and everybody's lips, people were willing to talk about Nkrumah. Um, and um, and whenever they did, so, they were connecting like Nkrumah um, to sort of however they saw the trajectory of the country since independence. Uh, mm -hmm. There's sort of this idea like that came about where it seemed like Nkrumah had like this afterlife where he still had like a physical or a um, not physical um, an active hand in the um, in the fate of the nation even after he died. Like. Um, and for the people who um, were celebrating him, it was a hand that was leading to what appeared to be a, um, a Ghana sort of rise into what was seen as sort of the, the sort of middle economic group country. Um, um, for those who were opposed to him, like the, there was this way that they tried to um, to minimize Nkrumah, Nkrumah's presence, mm -hmm. um, as and then sort of celebrate. Um, a path towards the MPP as sort of an alternative path to, um, from what Nkrumah offered. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for that response. So now getting to the book, getting to uh, living with Nkrumahism, um, can you give us a brief synopsis of this book and what you consider to be its central argument, if not arguments, if there are many? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think to think about what the central argument was is, Connected to like the driving question um, that I came up with while doing this research, and that was sort of how do we understand the role of Pan Africanism and socialism in Ghana um, um, during the 1950s and 1960s? So during the time when Nkrumah is um, in power, um, if you look back at sort of the political science um, literature of that developed. Um, that began to develop in the 50s and took off in the 60s in particular, and then gradually, it gradually begins to wane into the 70s and 80s. Um, but in all, but throughout this literature is this real emphasis on um, um, pan africanism and socialism as having like little effect um, beyond rhetoric within Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, most 
um, most political scientists um, and journalists too at this time, they're arguing like um, Nkrumah and his papers and his parties are, um, they can't stop talking about Pan-Africanism and socialism in particular. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of the driving discourse. Um, but then they, go, then they argue that it's not extending beyond the party or beyond the papers. Um, people don't care about it. It's not affecting their lives in really any meaningful way. Um, and, um, and so you have like this real um, <clears throat> emphasis on the, um, emphasis in the literature on um, providing a disconnect between um, um, the the discourse and the politics of the of this governing party in people's lives, um, and I never really bought into that. Right, mm -hmm. um, I uh, <clears throat> I began to think about like um, particularly as seeing like in the archives the way that. Um, uh, Pan Africanism and, and um, socialism and anti colonialism, in, uh, in addition, um, work their way into the, the daily machinations of these um, state organizations, the Young Pioneers, and so on and so forth. Um, you, um, I began to really wonder like, how could this um, not be making its way in some fashion to how people are understanding the, um, the world and the developing country around them? Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Um, so I began to ask, um, began to sort of ask questions about, um, about these organizations, like what are they doing? Um, how are they, um, how are people receiving and interact, receiving the messages from them, interacting with the organizations? Um, and in many cases, like these organizations became defining features of their lives. Um, and you could go up to many former young pioneers today and they'll be they'll be singing you the songs and explaining what it meant to them it's not always what it meant um it's, that's not always a symmetry between what it meant to them and what it meant to the party but it is something that was a defining feature of how they understood their life at the time in the in the 50s and in the 60s um uh -huh. that makes sense uh -huh. Uh -huh. so so what I sort of see as the driving goal of the book um, and sort of the, um, is um, a way to, is thinking through ways to understand um, um, everyday Ghanaian's experiences with ideas of Pan-Africanism and to see how Pan-Africanism and socialism um, and Krumism more broadly sort of this term that um, it's popular at the time that I think is useful. Um, how do everyday people interact with all of this um, in terms of understanding what it meant to be a Ghanaian in the 1950s and 60s um, um, as Ghana becomes a country and sees the sort of this, this transition from colonial rule to independence um, uh -huh. in relation to the changing world around them, a world in which um, by 19... Um, 66 when Krum was overthrown, pretty much all the continent um, north of Angola is um, is independent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's this mass, massive sort of changing world around them. Um, and they very much sort of see Nkrumah and Ghana as central to this. Um, so how does this sort of shape their everyday lives? Or, and um, the way they understand their everyday lives is probably a better way to put it. Um, so that's sort of the driving goal of the book. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for that. So uh, now uh, I have a question with uh, the, the two main uh, ideologies that, you, uh, that your book focuses on. Mm -hmm. um, that is to say Nkrumahism and Pan-Africanism. How do you conceptualize these two books in your, in your book, these two ideologies in your book? So in terms of how I conceptualize them, um, um, so <clears throat> maybe I'll take Nkrumahism first, which I see sort of as a part of sort of the broader framework of Pan-Africanism. Um, Nkrumahism um, is, in the context of the book, is this idea of, um, <clears throat> is this ideology focused on um, um, transforming Ghana into a Pan-African and a socialist a Pan-African socialist and anti-colonial state. Like these are the 
the three pillars of um, incremism as I see it. Um, mm -hmm. um, um, as I'm sure everyone in your audience knows, like, um, Ghana in March 1957 was very much uh, a, the center of the world's attention, right? Mm -hmm. um, as it became independent. Um, you have all kinds of people um, from the continent, from the diaspora, as well as from many, many other places within the world converging on Accra to see Ghanaian independence. Mm -hmm. um, Ghana is sort of seen as the, or as the um, first sub-Saharan African state to emerge from colonial rule, right? Um, um, there was sort of this massive um, effort within Ghana to sort of take advantage of this, right? Um, and Krumah sort of famously announces um, at the independence of Ghana that Ghana's independence is meaningless without the rest of the continent. Of the continent, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and he never, until he dies, he never abandons sort of this idea that um, Ghanaian independence is connected to African liberation. Mm -hmm. um, so this becomes sort of the foundational um, aspect of his, um, of his vision of the world, right? Yeah. Um, the socialist element of it is connected to ideas of development and modernization as he saw it. Um, it was, how do we construct a state that is more equitable, that breaks from sort of the capitalist um, um, extraction of colonial rule? Mm -hmm. um, some of this is, um, in, in, in his mind, this is very much sort of connected to industrialization. Um, but what he's really sort of focusing on is um, how does Ghana transform itself into a state that um, could, that in itself could be self-sufficient um, in a way that is no longer dependent on sort of the Walter Rodney model of colonial extraction and global yeah. political economy. Um, yeah. um, and in doing so, help develop the rest of the content, get connecting the Pan-African elements of it. Um, and then the anti-colonial is sort of very much sort of focused on Ghana as the site of um, anti-colonial activism from independence, basically until Nkrumah was overthrown. Um, <clears throat> so you have within the literature um, or within the disciplines more broadly, like you, the, a lot of people have sort of focused on trying to map out what um, incrumen incrumenism means as an ideology, some as a philosophy, right? Um, and it, become, it often becomes sort of very rigid um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, this is the definition of incrumenism as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and it becomes static. Mm -hmm. And the one thing historians don't like is when people make things static, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so what I begin to think through and begin to see is like this incrumism as it's operating within Ghana is not stable, it's not historically stable, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's changing as the circumstances of um, decolonization within Ghana, um, politics within Ghana, decolonization and politics in Africa, as well as within the Cold War are mm, um, wonderful, are shifting. Um, <clears throat> and so I begin to think about um, about incrumism as a sort of a moving target. Um, it's something that Nkrumah in is coming up with and is developing um, as the circumstances change around him. The press is the Ghanaian press, much of it is state owned, um, uh -huh. is taking what it sees as um, important from Nkrumahism and then um, projecting it outwards. And then people on the ground are taking what they see as Nkrumahism and then adapting it for themselves. Um, some rejecting it, some accepting it, some using it to, um, to make claims with and against the state. Um, but Nkrumahism becomes this really sort of changing thing as circumstances change um, in the world of the 1950s and 1960s. Um, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> it very much sort of shows this ad adaptation, this process of adaptation. Um, <clears throat> um, but since it always has sort of this element of Pan-Africanism, right? Um, um, I see it as sort of this, uh, within this sort of this broader umbrella of Pan-Africanism. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and like defining Pan-Africanism is, it's a little bit trickier, right? Um, yeah. It has, it's much bigger in terms, it's, in some instances it could be considered global in scope. Um, it has a longer sort of historical trajectory. Um, we could talk about sort of black internationalism. We could talk about the intellectual traditions of Leiden and Cromwell, or Crum Crumwell, excuse me, um, um, Du Bois, Padmore. Um, we could talk about the way, um, particularly after the organization African Unity develops um, and or is inaugurated in 1963, how it becomes state-based. Um, so pan is this huge sort of umbrella uh -huh. that um, we, um, that needs to be historicized in its own right. Um, <clears throat> um, so what I see is in as being a feature within um, this broader umbrella of Pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. where people are, um, <clears throat> where people in Ghana are, in many cases, engaging with many of the same ideas. Like um, the people around in Kruma were, um, Many of them were hanging out with Padmore in London and, and in Man London and Manchester in the 1940s, right? Um, du Bois ends up in Ghana, um, mm -hmm. dies in Ghana. Um, um, Ghana is a founding member of the OAU. Um, <clears throat> so it finds its sort of way within the broader sort of um, sphere uh, of good name in African politics in the 1950s um, and 60s, um, but in Krumism very much sort of is within this broader umbrella, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it, I get it. Well, thank you very much for that. And you raise a very important, uh, a very important idea within this broader framework of decolonization, that is to say the Cold War, the impact of the Cold War. I, I, I've noticed uh, from, from so many readings and including the reading of your work that the Cold War it had a very significant impact on the decolonization of Africa and even the process, the liberation movement itself of African countries. Many of these countries were found themselves trapped in a dilemma of having to choose to affiliate either with the socialist bloc led by the Soviet Union or the capitalist bloc led by the United States. Now, looking at it from, 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 from this uh, and from your analysis in the book, what was the impact of the Cold War uh, in the de decolonization politics of, of, of African countries and, in, and to say Ghana in particular? Yeah, so the Cold War is foundational in, to um, how Nkrumah's sort of understanding um, the, the global politics around him, um, as well as in terms of how he is envision, envisioning an alternative. Um, um, so just sort of to set it up, um, Ghana sort of coming from the Gold, Gold Coast, uh, um, I mean, it was a British colony. Um, mm -hmm. The expectation um, by the British um, and, um, and by the United States was that it would stay aligned with, um, with sort of the, um, with the West um, coming out of independence, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was going to sort of, it was supposed to be within this block. Right, um, and the um, the West very much looked um, to these newly independent countries like Ghana um, with fear whenever they sort of turned somewhat of an eye towards um, the Soviet bloc. Um, mm -hmm. It became like a it became a boogeyman for them in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so, in Kruma, like at nearly all African leaders, sort of at this time, like they felt this tension, this pull um, um, within their politics where they felt like they're continually being pulled towards, um, towards the interests of their former colonial powers or the West more broadly, if you want to include the United States within this. Um, mm -hmm. um, and Nkrumah, um, he saw this as very much a threat to Ghana's independence. Um, this, um, this is sort of where the idea of the neocolonial comes in, right? Um, he's arguing that um, <clears throat> if um, um, if Ghana as an independent state is still beholden to to the British or becomes beholden to the United States, who no longer actually have a have sort of the um, to live up to the expectations that a colonial power would even have 
to live up to um, um, uh, among the subjects, right? Like when under colonial rule, there were expectations that the British um, had to um, to live up to as a colonizing power, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Gold Coast citizens could make claims against the British state mm -hmm. um, uh, or, or the colonial state. Um, uh, without that, um, Nkrumah, be, uh, he argued that there was a m major threat to, um, uh, to Ghana because it could just become this unadulterated um, extraction um, and yeah. use of power against um, against Ghana, limiting its independence. <clears throat> uh -huh. um, so Nkrumah with um, Seiko Torre, Nasser, um, Nero in India, like these, these um, leaders in the 1950s and 1960s, they began to really argue for um, alternative paths forward. This is where you get the non-aligned movement. Um, and this idea that uh, I mean, Nkrumah expresses it quite clearly, like we look neither east nor west, we look yeah. forward, right? Um, mm -hmm. They began to try to forge a path forward um, for themselves where they will engage, will, they'll engage both, um, both spheres um, <clears throat> and um, as a way to try to negotiate deals for themselves so that they could um, develop on their own terms. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, Nasser at the As Aswan Dam, right? Um, um, Lakosamo Dam within Ghana uh, became sort of part of th this, in theory, it became sort of part of this way where you could have sort of Nkrumah trying to play um, the, the British off the Soviets and the Americans off the Soviets. And that's how the Americans actually came in to fund it. Um, what actually turned out is that with this all, almost becomes sort of a classic study of neocolonialism, but that's sort of another story. Um, um, what, but, so the point is you have Nkrumah here trying to forge a, a path forward independent of sort of these Cold War interests. Uh -huh. um, however, the Cold War, um, <clears throat> it keeps sort of sucking them in, right? Yeah. Um, um, Nkrumah sees regular sort of threats to his state coming from the British and from the Americans. Um, the attempts on his life he sees as coming from sort of these, um, these Western interests. Um, and this really accelerates as he's watching um, um, coups and um, assassinations taking place. Taking place the uh, throughout the continent, yeah. Yes. Um, and I mean, the most important one, obviously, is Patrice Lumumba, um, mm -hmm. and that just that shakes him to the core um, uh -huh. and um, and really sort of changes the ways that he sees um, Ghana's path forward. He becomes much more militant after that, right? Uh -huh. um, begins to sort of see and um, em emphasize um, uh, the um, the neo th neo colonial threat to the colony or to uh -huh. so, excuse me to the country uh -huh. and to Africa more broadly. Um, so as this, as these things are changing, uh, as you see sort of the Congo situation in the Congo, as things um, um, really begin to um, become more and more violent in Algeria, um, um, as um, the um, the Portuguese wars in um, Mozambique and Angola and um, Guinea-Bissau. Um, He's sort of seeing this as sort of South Africa. He's seeing this as um, needs to, as sort of real threats to de the decolonization process, as it happened in places like Ghana, and begins to take a much more militant stand, arguing that more and more um, the Africans, the Ghanaians, um, in particular, like they need to really um, become more disciplined in their anti-colonial endeavors. Ghana mm -hmm. needs to think beyond a sort of nonviolent resistance to colonial rule. So Accra, and Accra Ghana more broadly becomes a um, place where you have militants training um, and so on and so forth. So the Cold War really is sort of this major um, site uh, or this major um, phenomenon that is shaping and reshaping how Nkrumah imagines um, 
the path forward. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Um, my last question for you uh, mm -hmm. is with regards to the literature review that you did for this book. Uh, what do you think about, about, about your book in particular? What contribution does it make to the existing uh, body of literature or the discourse on Pan-Africanism and the decolonization movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the real um, contribution that I hope that the book makes um, is in um, taking this broader um, international history of Pan-Africanism, decolonization, um, um, this history that is seen as sort of an international history, right, or a diplomatic history. Um, there are many, many sort of histories of the way decolonization um, affected um, Africa sort of from state levels, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, Pan-Africanism, the literature is, um, uh, the, or the more traditional literature, um, sort of focuses on like this transition from an idea to eventually get to sort of the state-based stuff with the OAU. Uh -huh. um, um, and it seems very detached from the way that um, everyday people experienced and thought about these ideas. So um, what I really sort of hope that people sort of take from this study is um, the way that these broader ideas work their way into everyday discussions, everyday lives. And, and, and then you have, and in doing so, you have people begin to develop sort of their own intellectual history of these ideas. Um, mm -hmm. um, and it becomes contested among um, people at the level, uh, uh, within the workplace, within um, youth organizations, within, um, um, within petitions. Um, people are petitioning, you know, petitioning state or their workplaces um, with ideas of Pan-Africanism uh -huh. um, or with social expectations of socialism. And they begin to challenge the state on its own terms. Um, um, and in doing so, they are creating like their own intellectual history um, um, of sort of these bigger um, topics that again, are almost always sort of taken as sort of high politics um, um, from this high politics perspective or this big, big thinker per perspective, right? Um, but really like I hope people would take from this sort of a way of thinking through um, um, this, these ideas as, um, I mean, it's sort of grassroots ideas. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, your participation, Professor Jeffrey Alman. Uh, this is the platform where I get to sit with established academics who have written uh, groundbreaking and outstanding books. Uh, and I get to sit with them and talk about the books for purposes of teaching and learning uh, so, th so that we can conscientize our student community and the ordinary person who finds it interesting. 